today in DC electrical circuits, we're going to be looking at lab number nine, mesh and nodal analysis. So under lab objective, it says the study of mesh and nodal analysis using Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law are the objectives of this exercise. Specifically, its usage in multi-source DC circuits, their application to finding circuit currents and voltages will be investigated. Under reference sections, I'm going to be referring to Shom's Outlines, Basic Electricity, 2nd Edition. We're going to look at Chapter 7, which is all about Kirchhoff's Laws, Mesh Currents, and Node Voltages. Chapter 8 talks about determinant solutions for DC networks, the determinant method for solving currents in a two mesh network. Now I'm going to skip over most of this and just show you how to use a calculator to solve for these. So in chapter 7 they're talking about Kirchhoff's laws and we have Kirchhoff's voltage law abbreviated as KVL and Kirchhoff's voltage law states that the voltage applied to a closed circuit equals the sum of the voltage drops in that circuit. Kirchhoff's current law, abbreviated as KCL, Kirchhoff's current law states that the sum of the currents entering a junction is equal to the sum of the currents leaving the junction. There is a section on mesh currents, and they give you an example in figure 7-7, of a two mesh circuit similar to the one that we're going to be working on today. There is a section on node voltages and figure 7-9 shows us nodes in a two mesh circuit which is similar to what we're working on today and you can see we have one, two currents entering a node and one current exiting the node. Chapter 8 is Determinant Solutions for DC Networks and they show you how to solve for second order determinants which is similar to the two mesh currents that we need to solve today. And you can see there's a section on determinant method for solving currents in a two mesh network. And figure 8.2 is an example of solving for a two mesh network using determinants. I'm going to show you how to set up the equations so you can just type them into your calculator. So you can see there's a fairly large theory overview. I'm not going to read the entire thing to you. But it is important to note that multi-source DC circuits may be analyzed using a mesh current technique. The process involves identifying a minimum number of small loops such that every component exists in at least one loop. Then we apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to each loop. Further in, it says multi-source DC circuits may be analyzed using a node voltage technique. The process involves identifying all of the circuit nodes, a node being a point where various branch currents combined. A reference node, usually ground, is included. Then Kirchhoff's current law is then applied to each node. So under schematic, figure 9.1, it's a fairly simple circuit. We have two power sources and three resistors. And today I've done a circuit simulation for you so we can find out what each of the node currents are supposed to be as well as the voltage at point A. So under procedure, step number one, it says using an ohm meter, check the values of your resistors and record the values under equipment. So under equipment, the adjustable DC power supply is going to be the Agilent Model E3630A. 
and I haven't bothered with its serial number. The digital multimeter is going to be the Mastec MSM9803 and I haven't bothered with its serial number. Now I've gone ahead and checked the resistance of my resistors. So the 4.7K is actually 4.61K ohms. The 6.8K ohm resistor is 6.73K ohms. And the 10K ohm resistor is 9.78K ohms. And as usual, I've gone out on the internet, got you a graphic, and written down the color codes for you so that you don't confuse your resistors. So under procedure, step number two, we're to consider the dual supply circuit of figure 9.1 using E1 equal to 6 volts, E2 equal to 15 volts, R1 is 4.7K, R2 is 6.8K, and R3 is 10K. It says to find the voltage from node A to ground mesh analysis may be used. This circuit may be described via two mesh currents. Loop 1 formed with E1, R1, and R3, and Loop 2 formed with E2, R3, and R2. Note that these mesh currents are the currents flowing through R1 and R2 respectively. So in figure 9.1 I've filled in the 6 volts for the supply, the 15 volts for the supply, R1 is 4.7K, R2 is 6.8K, and R3 is 10K. Now I've drawn in my two mesh loops, so remember they go clockwise, so I1 versus I2 or mesh 1 versus mesh 2. You'll notice that when you're going around a loop, we add them up. So the positive is going to be on this side if our current's flowing this way. On this loop, I've put in my plus and minus signs. So you can see as the current's flowing this way, this is the positive side, that's the negative side. And it's opposite to I1's current flow, where this is the positive side and this is the negative side. So I find it really helps me to put in the plus and minus signs as I go around each of the loops, so that I know whether to add or subtract the number when I'm building the equations. So under procedure, step number three, using Kirchhoff's voltage law, write the loop expressions for the two loops and then solve to find the mesh currents. Note that the third branch current, that of R3, is the combination of the mesh currents and that the voltage at node A can be determined using the combined mesh currents in Ohm's law. It says to compute these values and record them in table 9.1. Show your work on the Calculations Mesh Analysis page. So on page 3 of the lab, I've laid out the calculations for you, both for mesh analysis and nodal analysis. So for our calculations for mesh analysis, it says from Kirchhoff's voltage law, the sum of the voltages around the loop equals zero. So E1 plus V1 plus V3 loop is equal to zero. So as you're following the current around the loop, normally we start with the power supply. So you'll see this has a negative sign on this side. So we're going to go down six volts. And then we're going to go plus the voltage drop across R1. So V equals IR. So this is I1 times 4.7K plus the voltage drop across R3. So that's going to be I1 times the 10K ohms. So the equation for the loop becomes minus 6 plus 4.7K I1 plus 10K I1 and then 
the second loop for I2 ends up being minus 10k I2 equals 0. Remember it's minus because as you go around the loop this way I2 is going to be negative. For the second loop or the second equation you can see following the current in the clockwise direction you start with plus 15 volts. So the equation becomes plus 15 minus 10k I1 because of the negative sign on this side plus 10k I2 because of the plus sign on this side plus 6.8k I2 equals 0. Now I call this the simplified format because we're actually going to add the I1s together and the I2s together and put the uh, voltage on the uh, right hand side rather than the left hand side. So we need our equation to look something like this for our calculator. So A1x, x being I1, plus B1y, y being I2, is equal to our supplied voltage. So we have two equations and we have two unknowns. So looking at equation number one, you can see I've taken the 4.7k I1 plus the 10k I1 and added them together to get 14.7k I1. Then we subtract the 10k I2 and we've moved the voltage source to the other side of the equation so it goes from being minus 6 to plus 6. For the second equation we have minus 10k I1 and to that we're going to add the 10k plus the 6.8k I2 so that becomes 16.8k I2 and moving the plus 15 volts to the other side of the equation means we have an answer of minus 15. So now that we've set up the equations so we can enter them into our calculator, these are the steps that you're going to need to perform on your calculator. So the first thing we're going to do is going to set up and change it to engineering notation. So that's FSE. Two puts it in engineering notation. Then we want to set up the number of decimal places. So that's in setup, two, tab, three. So I want three decimal places. Then I'm going to put the calculator into mode two, which is equation. And I'm going to select zero, which is for two variables with two unknowns. Now every time you enter a number, so we're going to enter all of these six numbers into our calculator. So after you've entered every number, you press equal to do the enter or advance. And then when we're all done, we're going to put our calculator back into normal mode by typing in mode zero. But we do that when we're done. Okay, so this is your normal calculator display. It's showing fixed on the display. So to set it up, I'm going to press the setup button and I want to select number one for FSE and then I want to select two to put it in engineering mode. So now you can see the calculator says it's in engineering mode. So the next thing I want to do is press setup and I want to go to tab so I select two and this is the number of decimal places. I typically use three decimal places, so I press three. So now my calculator is set up in engineering mode with three decimal places. So I now want to put it into equation mode, so I press the mode button, and I want the mode to be equation, which is number two, so I press the down arrow key 
Now I can select 2 for equation. Now it's giving me the option of 0 for two value equations or one for a three value. So I have two equations with two unknowns, so I'm going to select zero. And now you can see it's asking me for A1. So looking at our equations, A1 is 14.7 now this is K, so I hit the EXP button and put in 3. So that's 14.7K, or 14.7 times 10 to the power of 3. So I press the equal button, and it now wants B1. And B1 is 10K, so I type in 10. Now remember it's minus, so the plus minus button will give me the minus and it's K so I press the EXP button and press 3. So that's my minus 10K. I press the equal button. Now it wants C1 which is 6 volts so I just press 6. And then I press equal and now it wants A2. Now A2 is minus 10K so I type in 1, 0 the plus minus button and then I need the exponent button and it's times 10 to the exponent of 3. So then I press the equal button. Now it wants B2. B2 is 16.8K so I type in 16.8 and then the EXP key and it's K so that's the exponent 3. And I press equal, and then it wants C2, and that's minus 15, so I press 1, 5, and then the plus minus key to make it minus 15, and then I press equal. So the answer that I'm looking for for I1 is actually minus 334.7. And you notice it's times 10 to the minus 6, so that's microamps. Now I press the equal key again. Now this is I2. So I2, you can see, is also minus, and that's 1.092 and it's times 10 to the minus 3, so that's milliamps. If you press equal again, it gives you the answer for the determinants, which we really don't need. And if you press equal again, it will ask you for A1 again. So every time you press equal, it will just step through to see if you need to change any of them before it gives you the answers again. So you can see for I1 I recorded minus 334.785 microamps. For I2 I recorded minus 1.092 milliamps. I3 is the current flowing through R3 so you'll notice it's I1 minus I2. And it's minus I2 because we sensed it flowing back up from ground to point A. So I3 is equal to minus 334.785 microamps minus the negative 1.092 milliamps and that works out to 757.215 microamps. Now to find the voltage at point A, we just take I3 times R3, basic Ohm's law, so that's 757.215 microamps times 10K, and that equals 7.5. 572 volts. 
So in table 9.1, under theory, I've recorded IR1, IR2, IR3, and VA. So under procedure, step number four, it says to consider the dual supply circuit of figure 9.1 as above. Now to find the voltage from node A to ground, nodal analysis may be applied. In this circuit, note that there is only one node and therefore only one equation with one unknown is needed. Once this potential is found, all other circuit currents and voltages may be found by applying Ohm's law and or Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law. So as you can see, under calculations for nodal analysis, I've filled in my schematic with the value of R1, R2, R3, E1, and E2. I'm going to assume that the current flowing from E2 will flow towards point A, and I'm going to assume the current from E1 flowing through R1 is going to flow into node A, and the current flowing out to ground is going to be the output. You'll notice I've got Kirchhoff's current law stating that the sum of the currents at point A have to equal zero, so I1 plus I2 minus I3 is equal to zero. Thus, I3 equals I1 plus I2. And that's how I've drawn it here, and I've just made that assumption. So under procedure, step number five, we're to write the node equation for the circuit of figure 9-1 and solve for the node voltage A. Also, determine the current through R3. Record these values in table 9.2, Show your work on the Calculations Nodal Analysis page. So assuming those directions of current flow, I've written my calculations for I1, I2, and I3. So remember it's just basic Ohm's Law, so I1 is equal to V1 over R1. So you'll notice that V1 is 6 volts coming in minus the voltage at point A. So I just write down 6 volts minus VA and divide it by R1 which is 4.7K. For current 2, I take V2 divided by R2. In this case it's 15 minus VA. So I write down 15 minus VA and divide it by R2, which is 6.8K ohms. For my last current, I3, it's equal to VA divided by R3. Remember, VA is the same as the voltage drop across R3 because it's with respect to ground. So the equation becomes VA divided by 10K ohms. So my principal node equation at point A is equal to I3 is equal to I1 plus I2. So the sum of the currents entering the node has to equal the current exiting the node. So the equation becomes VA divided by 10K, that's I3, is equal to 6 volts minus VA divided by 4.7K, that's I1 plus 15 minus VA divided by 6.8K, that's I2. Now the next thing we need to do is clear out all those fractions. So normally we use the least common denominator, or the LCD. In our case, our LCD is going to be equal to the 10K times the 4.7K times the 6.8k and that's equal to 319.6 giga 
ohms. We're going to let the calculator do the work for us rather than trying to get this down to a smaller number. So now we multiply our entire equation by 319.6 gig. So I3 becomes 319.6 gig times VA divided by 10K. And that's equal to I1, which is 319.6 gig times and in parentheses I have 6 volts minus VA because you have to multiply both of those and then we divide it by the 4.7K. And then finally we add I2 so that also becomes 319.6 gig times in parentheses 15 minus VA divided by the 6.8K ohms. So once you take the 319.6 gig and divide it by 10k, we end up with 31.96 meg times VA, and that's equal to 408 meg minus 68 meg VA plus 705 meg minus 47 meg times VA. So now we can regroup all of these and we end up with 31.96 meg VA plus 68 meg VA plus 47 meg VA. So that's our VA on one side of our equation. On the other side we're left with 408 meg plus 705 meg. So simplifying that down, we end up with 146.96 meg VA, and that's equal to 1.113 gig. So in the final step, we rearrange to solve for VA, and that's going to be equal to 1.113 gig divided by 146.96 meg. And that works out to 7.573 volts. So in table 9.2, I've recorded VA as 7.573 volts. And you'll notice that's pretty darn close to the 7.572 volts that we calculated using mesh analysis. Now to find the current going through I, R3, Remember, we're going to take V equals IR, so I equals V over R. So I take the 7.573 volts and divide it by R3, which is 10K ohms, and that works out to 757.3 microamps, which again is close to what we calculated using mesh analysis, and that worked out to 757.215 microamps. So under procedure, step number six, it says to build the circuit of figure 9.1 using the values specified in step two. We're to measure the three branch currents and record them in table 9.1 and copy IR3 to table 9.2. We're then to measure the voltage from node A to ground and record it in table 9.1 and table 9.2. It says to be sure to note the directions and polarities and finally determine and record the deviations in table 9.1 and table 9.2. So I'm going to try and wire up the circuit of figure 9.1 on my trainer so that it matches the schematic shown here. So looking at the circuit on my trainer, I've wired up the same as figure 9.1. So the red lead is bringing in 6 volts to the 4.7K ohm resistor. The yellow lead is bringing in 15 volts to the 6.8K ohm resistor. 
The 10K ohm resistor is connected to the black lead that goes to the common of the power supply. And all three resistors are in the same bus line representing point A or node A. So to measure my first current, which is the current flowing through resistor number one or IR1, what I've done is I've disconnected R1 from the common node and put it in an unused bus. I've then run that to the red lead of the ammeter. The black lead of the ammeter goes to either R2 or R3 because they're connected together. Now because I know that IR1 is going to be somewhere around 300 microamps, I've set the range dial on the ammeter to the lowest setting of 4 milliamps. The black banana lead goes into the common terminal. The red banana lead goes into the milliamp terminal. And you can see the current reading for I R1 is minus 322 microamps. That's 0.322 milliamps. So in table 9.1, under experimental IR1, I've recorded minus 322 microamps. Now to take the current reading, IR2, you can see I've reconnected R1 back to the common node. I now have my red banana lead connected to the top of R3, which is the 10K ohm resistor. I've now disconnected R2, which is the 6.8K ohm resistor, from the common node and put it in an unused bus. And I've reconnected the ammeter with the black banana lead. So I've left the dial on the 4 milliamp range and you can see I'm reading minus 1.089 milliamps. So in table 9.1 under experimental IR2 I've recorded minus 1.089 milliamps. To measure the current IR3 that's the current flowing through resistor 3 I've taken the leg of the 10K ohm resistor out of the bus line that was the common node, moved it down to an unused bus line. The red lead of the ammeter goes to R1. The black lead of the ammeter goes to R3, which is the 10K ohm resistor. So once again, I've left it on the 4 milliamp range, and I'm reading 0.767 milliamps, that's 767 microamps, and please note that it is positive. So on table 9.1, under experimental IR3, I've recorded 767 microamps. And under table 9.2, under experimental for IR3, I've also recorded 767 microamps. So to record the voltage at point A with respect to common, or the voltage drop across R3, I've now reconnected my three resistors to the common point, which is labeled point A. The red banana lead goes to my voltmeter and I've connected it to the top of R3. The black lead goes to the bottom of my 10K ohm resistor. So you can see I've rotated the dial on the digital multimeter till it says volts with a flat line, that's DC volts. And I've moved the red banana lead into the hole labeled volts, ohms, capacitance, and frequency. And you can see on the display of the digital multimeter, I'm getting a reading of 7.58 volts. 
So in table 9.1, under experimental, VA, I've recorded 7.58 volts. And I'm going to leave you to calculate the percent deviation. And then on table 9.2, under experimental, VA, I've recorded the 7.58 volts. And again, I'm going to leave you to calculate the percent deviation. On the last page of the lab, I have six questions for you to answer based on your calculations, observations, and conclusions. When you've completed your lab, leave your circuit set up on the trainer so your instructor can verify its operation. They will then initial your lab sheet to indicate that it is complete. Mm -hmm.